that community councils, from our point of view, from the government's point of view, are an essential part of the democratic structures in Wales. I think some might say you're, you are actually a bit of a, a Cinderella service, in the sense that most of the focus is often on principal councils. But actually, for me, I, I see you as the first link in the democratic chain. It is your councils that provide the foundation for local government. You are the, the barrier, the, if you like, the enabler that links with local people, helps to shape decisions of others, including principal councils, and helps bring life to your communities. So it's important that you play a full role in democracy, and I know that you do, but actually that others appreciate that role as well. And before I begin, I ought to say, I don't underestimate how difficult it is to play that role effectively. As Bob Dylan said many years ago, times are changing, and certainly that is true. Before I talk about this slide, I'd like to just reflect on the times that we're in. And in particular, the fact that we are in extremely turbulent economic times. As the local government minister has said on a number of occasions, the, Assembly, the Welsh government will lose over £2 billion from its budget, uh, or has lost over £2 billion from its budget over the last three to four years. That's a huge amount of money. We heard the coalition government in Whitehall uh, announcing potentially another £10 billion worth of savings on top of what it's already taking up through the welfare reform programme. If that £10 billion comes to pass, it's likely that Wales will lose £500, billion, £500 million. And as we know, the socio-economic structures of Wales, it's likely the impact of that money leaving us will have a disproportionate effect on our poor and vulnerable people. We also know that next month there will be the Chancellor's Autumn Statement, and it's likely that as part of that there will be further retrenchment of public service spending. So the impact of this is, and I believe will continue to be for some time yet, absolutely significant. It impacts on what you do and how you live your lives. In fact, it impacts on how all of us live our lives. And as a consequence, that means something very important for you and for me, and that is participation in the democratic process. At a time when resources are going down, the demand for services from the public service is going up, good quality, effective scrutiny, clear accountability is absolutely essential if we are to get the best from our service providers. So what I want to talk about this morning a little is what the Welsh Government has done to try and create the circumstances in which that accountability and scrutiny can happen in a more effective way. And there are two main pieces of legislation, uh, one of which is the Local Government, of, uh, Local Government Wales Measure 2011, and one of which is the Local Government Democracy Bill, which will be published uh, later on this year. And essentially we believe that both of these pieces of legislation together should make local government in all its forms more representative, more accountable to local people, uh, and more importantly, connected to local people. And I think one of the most important parts of certainly the 2011 measure, which many of you will be familiar with, is the power to promote well-being. Now, I'm sure most of you know this, and, and shout at me if you do, but local authorities and other public bodies can only act where they have the legal, uh, legal clearance, the legal authority to do so. So if they want to provide a service, or if they want to enter into arrangements with somebody else, then they need to find that piece of statute that will enable them to do it. This is good, in a sense. It stops people going off doing crazy things that, that really uh, are no good for anybody. But at the same time, it provides a barrier. Because if you can't find the right piece of legislation, or it's not quite what you want to do, it can hamper the delivery of services or the organisation of, of, of uh, services as well. So the power of well-being, the power to promote well-being, is really key. It's become, if you like, a power of first resort because what it does, it enables you as councils to do anything that you consider uh, likely to promote 
the economic, social or environmental well-being of your area, your communities and the people who live in them. You can see the links between what I'm saying here about well-being and the previous speakers. It is a theme that is running more and more through everything that we do. It is important to say, however, that we haven't defined, defined well-being on the face of the, of the measure. That is really defeating the object. It is a very broad power and it is up to, to uh, public service organisations and councils to go and test the boundaries of that. But I would say that in using the power of well-being, you still need to bear in mind all of the standard things that you would normally do when you take a decision. You need to make sure that you've considered options. You need to make sure that uh, the finance is there, that it's being spent well, and procurement is, is being done in the correct way. Because as we know, there will always be the day that you hear the knock on, at the door and the auditors come to examine what you've been up to. So be prepared for them. So as I say, the power of well-being is very broad. You have to exercise it with care. But there are limits. Um, it is not a power that you can use to do anything that you want. It is discretionary and that means that if there is other legislation on the statute books which prohibits you from doing something, then the power of well-being won't override, it won't circumvent or undermine that power. So I've given you an example here. The Equalities Act 2010 and, and the requirements of that, the power of well-being won't enable you to ignore or circumvent those uh, provisions. Neither can you use the power in itself to raise funds or to create bylaws for the regulation of conduct of uh, members. So, very broad, you need to exercise it with caution, but actually, as I say, it, can, it can't replace or circumvent existing legislation. In terms of using the new powers, I, I thought I'd share with you the sort of standard civil service speak um, of what, what this means. And here is a list of things that uh, we think the well-being power could easily, easily enhance. So local service delivery, if you wanted to improve a local bus service, for example, promote sustainable development, well, of course, we'd all expect that to be in there. But that's, again, about how you can organise your business and organise your communities so that they're in, in this for the long term. Improve mental and physical health. I'll give you an example of how that can be done and has been done by uh, a council later. Tackle poverty and, de and deprivation. Well, clearly, what I said earlier about the financial conditions, the, the, the future demands on public services, that has got to be something where the well-being power is used. Finally, oh, sorry, not quite finally, promote economic development, self-evident. If you need or want to support local business or the local economy, the power of well-being will enable you to do that. And finally, improve community safety, improve street lighting, pathways, and so on and so on. I'm sure you know all of these examples. But how might you actually do some of the things that we've just been talking about? Well, as I think I mentioned grants, you could use the power of well-being to give financial assistance to uh, any one person. You might also enter, agree in, enter into agreements, potentially with third sector organisations, to work in partnership to deliver some of these things. You might also uh, exercise, this is sorry, this is legalese, I didn't write this particular bit, exercise on behalf of any person, any functions of that person. What that means really is that your principal counsel could delegate something to you and the well power of well-being would give you the opportunity to do that, to, access, to, to uh, fulfill that service. And similarly with the last, with the last point. But it's, it's still sort of early days. I mean, what, what examples are there that, of, of uh, town and communi community councils that have actually used this? Well, Oswestry, Street, uh, I think, is, is, is one uh, a beacon that has spent, I think, about 30-odd thousand pounds to maintain the provision of an audiology clinic in the local community, which the health uh, authority was otherwise going to close. Now, clearly, this is a fantastic idea. If it means people can continue to receive their services on their doorstep, that will 
that would contribute to improving so uh, local service delivery, its mental, social and physical health, and so on. You can see the advantages there. Similarly, over the border in England, um, Hadfield Town, I think, have taken over their allotments from their, their local council. And the fact that they now uh, are in charge has meant that they can secure grants, they can repair, they can rebuild, and they can improve facilities. And again, a really clear link across to the sustainable development agenda. And that wouldn't have happened had the community council not had the power of well-being and not stepped in. So those are the sort of possible actions that the power of well-being will enable you to, to, to take. It's still early days, but actually it offers an enormous opportunity, enormous challenges, uh, for you to begin to take on new functions and uh, new community roles. Turning to the, the Local Democracy Bill, um, it's not quite a bill yet because we haven't published it. We did consult earlier on in the year um, with our Promoting Democracy white, pa uh, white Paper and we hope to publish a draft of the bill uh, next month. We were very pleased actually that we had 91 responses to the cons consultation but we were even more pleased that over a third of those came from you. They came from community councils. I mean, a fantastic response for which we are very grateful and it is really good to be able to demonstrate that the sector is, is engaging in some of these really tricky issues. I'll just give you four main themes of the bill. Um, I mean, first of all, you will probably be aware that, that uh, a couple of years ago we had some, uh, there were some issues with the Local Government Boundary Commission. Glyn Mathias, a very ex experienced electoral commissioner, uh, did a review and recommended a, a number of, that the government undertakes a number of things to try and get the Boundary Commission up to date, make it function more effectively and actually uh, expand some of its roles and responsibilities. So part of the bill is about modernising that and I'll come on to what that means for you in a moment. It's also about reforming the conduct of, of the reviews and actually for the first time to enable the Commission to look at the membership of public bodies. And finally, uh, I think and very relevant here, is about how to enable community councils to become more accessible and engaged with the public than you already are. Just considering the, the um, changes as they relate to the Boundary Commission. What we're hoping to do here, subject to the, the bill being passed through the, the Assembly, um, is to, to create a new power that will enable the Commission to change community boundaries when it is changing the principal council boundaries. At the moment, when wards are being determined, they are sort of slightly constrained by community council boundaries. So we believe that that needs to be changed, and that needs to be changed for a number of reasons, but also because it's a, it's, there is a duty on principal councils to review your boundaries. We're going to make that happen once every 15 years, probably. And where that doesn't happen, the, bound, the Local Government Boundary Commission will be able to undertake those reviews, either on behalf of the Council or if it's not satisfied with the results. So that's pretty much what, the boundary, uh, what we're hoping to do with the, the Boundary Commission. And moving on just for a moment to what it means, uh, what the Democracy Bill means for you. Times are changing, I mentioned that earlier on, and I think somebody else mentioned that the way that we live our lives is also changing. I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, in fact, many, many times a day, all of us will engage with electronic media in some form. We'll go on the internet on our phones or our laptops or our, or our computers. And you only have to look across the border to, to England to see what this means for public services. The coalition government in Whitehall its policy is called digital by default. You've probably heard of that. And that means, in future, the expectation is that when you interact with public services, you will do so through the internet or some other electronic media. Face-to-face -face is considered you know, quite expensive and increasingly unnecessary in all but some of the, the most extreme cases. So that sets a completely different scene for us all, for us in government, how do we, in, how do we interact with our citizens, but how do you as, as councils interact with yours? And so 
the Democracy Bill will propose that you need to make some of your information about your membership, about your council and its business available to the public electronically. They will also need to be able to communicate with you electronically. And I must say, I know that the variety of uh, support of development in, in this area is quite considerable across the 700 or so community councils. And so I don't think any of us underestimate what this might mean for some of you. It is a challenge. But actually, going back to what I was saying at the beginning, if community councils really want to rise to the challenges and to fulfil their role as that foundation of, of the Welsh democratic structures, it's essential that you can begin to engage in a way that people can easily engage with and increasingly will expect to engage with you. I would say that given the variety of, of development, we will not be expecting uh, all of you to be fully wired up on the day that the bill comes in. And we will also understand that you will need some help and support to get from where you are now to where you need to be. So the government is, is committed to providing help to One Voice Wales and to provide sufficient time to enable you to fulfil this requirement effectively. Looking forward, I hope that you, you see the next few years really as a time of, of opportunity, but also challenge for all layers of government. Uh, principal councils are being challenged constantly by our ministers, and quite rightly so. But at the same time, there are challenges for you too, to be able to rise uh, to some of these, these, or rise to deal with some of these problems, and to help principal councils, or actually take back some of the functions potentially, to your local communities. And so you can begin to own and drive forward uh, the change and improvement agendas. And I know that One Voice Wales has made significant inroads into that over the last few months. So that's really all I have to say, other than I will go back to where I started, which is community councils are and can be the first stage of the Welsh democratic process. I challenge you all to rise to that and fulfil it. Thank you.